I'm going to start off by talking about Robert Lucas, who is, of course, the one of the two central characters here, he and his wife, Friendly, uh, at the Plum Grove house and this wonderful estate that I wish I owned and lived in and had somebody else to mow. Uh, Robert Lucas was an interesting man. He was a very uh, important figure politically and he was a very important figure militarily. He served in the War of 1812. He was also the governor of Ohio. And then uh, when Iowa was made a territory in 1838, the then president, whom you all know who was president in 1838, appointed him, don't you? <laughs> Martin Van Buren appointed him to be the uh, charity, you knew that, the governor of the Iowa Territory. He's the first appointed governor and the only governor of Iowa who also had served as a governor of another state. His party at the time he was appointed was the Democratic Republican Party. The alternative party was the Whig Party. The Republican Party didn't come into being until uh, 1854, and the Democrats dropped the name Republican in the 1840s. Now, he was a very strong political leader. That was important when a territory is getting started to shape the idea of having a strong executive. Had he been a weak executive, our Constitution would have been different for the state when we became a state. A lot of things would have been different. I want to uh, share with you something from the Palimpsest of August 1944. The Palimpsest is one of the magazines published by the State Historical Society. And this particular article is about Robert Lucas as a poet. Now, he was a very religious man. He was a very strong Methodist. He was a very strong believer in temperance. And he belonged to an organization of absolute abstinence from alcoholic beverages, as did a number of other leaders in town. But this is one of his poems, so bear with me. It's not great literature, but it tells something about the man. Cities have pearly gates. The streets are paved with gold, with seas of glass and crystal lakes and beauties yet untold. There is perpetual day, no darkness of the night, and all who gospel truth obey have a preemption right. Now I read this particular one because the preemption acts of the 1830s and the 1840s were important in the settlement of Iowa. You could not legally purchase land in Iowa until the U.S. government land office had surveyed it. However, a lot of people didn't know where they had surveyed, didn't pay any attention to that, came in and they were known as squatters. When you squatted, sat on land illegally, and you farmed it, and you built a house, then when it came up for sale, if the U.S. Congress had passed a preemption right, you had the right to bid on that land at the minimum price first before anybody else did. So he's talking about people who behave properly have preemption rights in heaven, which is what the poem is about. He's combining his Methodism with his uh, uh, political affiliations here. I think we uh, don't need to hear any more of them. They're almost all uh, very religious, but might be nice just to know another aspect of Robert Lucas as, as a poet. His wife, Friendly, was noted as a very good cook and a very hospitable hostess for him, for his economic uh, contacts and his political contacts. Uh, and between the two of them, they were probably the two best known citizens of Iowa City. Now I think we're going to have to move you and I'm yeah, going to turn it over to, to Jeff. Well, just a quick little comment about the area, mm -hmm. uh, trying to envision it when, when Lucas was mm -hmm. here. Um, if you look at the house, it doesn't look by our modern standards as a very particularly large or elegant house. For its day though, in terms of when it was built and the situations in the territory, it was quite an accomplishment. And for its day, it would have been considered a, a large house and a, a, a rather fine house. But it was a farmhouse in the final analysis because they lived here and had livestock. The archeological uh, displays you see around here show that they had you know, chickens and pigs and cows. And, and this was a working farmstead. A small one, 40 acre one. Right, right. Yeah. 
again, for its day, that would that, that would have been. Not there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Not there. Um, what the original vegetation would have been like, uh, we don't know exactly. Of course, you have a reconstruction here of a, a garden, a kitchen garden, which is uh, quite likely that something like that existed uh, on the site. The uh, topography of the area is high enough above the floodplain that we probably had uh, uh, kind of an open savanna sort of environment in which there would have been oak trees like the uh, bur oak we see behind us, uh, bur oaks and white oaks, uh, and grassland, which then they could utilize as uh, pasture. The name, uh, I'm not sure of the origin of the name, but that kind of savanna open land uh, would have had native American wild plum thickets as part of the natural vegetation, and of course they could have been partial to plums and brought some with them and had them in, the, in their little orchard, I don't know. but. Uh, in any case, this really would have, if you could have been here when the Lucases were here, this really would have made you think of a farm. And it really was beyond the original plat of the city, so it really was outside the city of Iowa City when they lived here. I neglected to give Lucas's dates. Uh, he was governor, appointed in 1838, and with the election of 1840, the Whigs won the presidential election, so another territorial uh, governor was appointed a Whig. Uh, they built this house in 1844, and then Robert himself died in 1853. So that's the period of time when he would have lived here. Yeah. Okay, now we can take our walk. Now we can start walking. <laughs> I do want to uh, talk just a little bit about the construction of the house and about architecture in general. Uh, the house has been variously described as uh, classical revival, Greek revival, or late Georgian, and it has elements of all of that in it. But if you look right over the front door, you'll see that the lintel is a very simple slab. That's characteristic of all of those styles of architecture, you'll notice that the sills under the windows and the doors are all simple and unornamented. If it were a true Greek revival house, the cornice, the elements that come in from the roof line up here, would continue all the way across, creating a triangular element up here in the gable. And it doesn't. It's a return cornice, which means it clips in a little ways and your eye is supposed to carry across and make that a, com a complete triangle. It's called a pedimented, uh, a pediment, but it doesn't do that. You'll notice that over the windows, they have used bricks as the lintels. They have set them in uh, opposite to the way the courses are laid in the house itself. Those are called segmental lintels. And if you'll notice also, I have to get in the shade myself here, the long side of the brick is called the stretcher, the end of the brick is called the header, and you will alternate courses of headers with stretchers, and all of those different bonds uh, pattern have a name. We don't need to go into that now, but when you look at a brick house, do count the rows of stretchers vis-a-vis -vis the rows of headers. If it is simply no headers showing and all stretchers in this alternating bond, that's just a running bond. But all of the others uh, do have uh, names. You'll notice that the windows also have a great many panes. It would have been in 1844 extraordinarily difficult to bring a large pane of glass to this area. So they have lots of small panes, uh, typical of the time. They would have built a house uh, from really two sources of inspiration. One, their home in Ohio, which was called Friendly Grove, after Robert's wife. And the other one is whatever was stylish at the time. And there is no time after 1839 in Iowa's history when you did not have available the plans for whatever was stylish on the East Coast architecturally. We were never out of the realm of knowing and being able to imitate whatever was popular. Uh, Jeff? Behind me here we have some uh, plum trees and that could be the reference for the, for the name that kind of, uh, this happens to be a uh, uh, horticultural plum but the wild plums that were native around here look quite similar. 
Now I think what we're doing is we're going to go essentially down their lane and out onto what now is a very major street and a very integral part of the city, but which of course wasn't part of the city then. It would have been a country road. So let's go that out to uh, Kirkwood there and uh, see what happened when the city came out to the farm. We're going to walk down to Kirkwood Avenue, which was a major road to Muscatine called Bloomington at the time. And in fact, when Robert Lucas came to Iowa City as the governor and Iowa City was the capital, his family stayed in Bloomington and did not move here until after the time uh, he ceased being governor. So he had two residences. Uh, he had to stay in a boarding house when he was here acting as governor, and then he had a home in Bloomington, now Muscatine. And this is the road to Muscatine. Muscatine was the major point uh, where river traffic stopped and debarked, uh, uh, disembarked passengers and goods to come to Iowa City. They usually did not go to Davenport. That route would have been much harder to follow and uh, Burlington would have been farther, so they came to Muscatine and came overland. There were always roads and trails from Bloomington or Muscatine to Iowa City. Here's an interesting little feature on the way. It's something you rarely see nowadays, but was very popular in Victorian times. This is trumpet vine that has probably volunteered to grow up an old clothes pole. What was popularly done in Victorian times is that a major pole was driven into the ground and then a wagon wheel was placed on top, affixed on top, and then the vine was trained up the pole and through the uh, wagon wheel, which then it spread out and was trimmed to make a, a freestanding, lovely canopy like this. So uh, this is something I say you rarely see anymore, but uh, trumpet vines are a huge uh, attraction to hummingbirds and it's very lovely and it'll bloom for a long, long period of time. So it's an idea you might copy even in a small yard because you get a lot of plant you turn a vine into essentially a tree <laughs> it'll climb on its own but what you need is you see what a very large thing it is you don't want to start with a flimsy pole you want to start with a very very substantial probably about like 10 feet long put at least drive at least four feet of it into the ground and make sure it's well anchored and then on the top you want something very substantial. This looks to me like it's an old clothes pole, and of course clothes poles had to be very substantial, but if you get a sound wagon wheel, that will stay together long enough for the, the tree to, uh, it's uh, what horticulturalists refer to as training them into a standard, a freestanding standard, and it's very handsome, you know, I think. It's typical Victorian, and we have to remember that Queen Victoria came to the throne of England in 1837, so everything we're talking about is within the Victorian period until she died in 1901. Uh, friendly Lucas herself would have raised her children to be good Victorian people and to follow the etiquette books. Robert himself was old enough by that time that he probably didn't change and become very Victorian. <laughs> Okay, now we're out here on the, on the main street, um, and the thing I particularly want you to notice is that you don't have to be an architectural historian to get a really good general idea of the age of a house that's built along this street. The age is inversely proportional to the distance. In other words, the greater the sit back from the road, the further the house is back from the road, the older it is. So certainly the oldest house in this uh, neighborhood is Plum Grove itself. And it really wasn't responding much to the, this except it happened to face out onto what probably was an existing road at the time and then a lane came into, into the property. All of these houses that we'll be passing now address themselves to the street. There was an existing thoroughfare. It eventually became bricked and paved and so forth, but they addressed themselves to that, and you get a real sense of what people thought was the appropriate distance to the street. 
By the time we got to the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, this is the proper setback. You can see on this typical bungalow and its distance from the street and similar turn of the century houses on the other side that there was that was the generally assumed proper distance. As we go down the street we'll be coming to some houses that are older and again the further they are from the street the older that they'll be, the more original to the site. And so these others have come as fill in. And to orient even further, in 1844 the city limits would have been where that limestone plinth is on Court and Summit. By 1852, uh, right before Robert Lucas died, this would have been the city limits. So it grew that much in that ensuing, what, eight years as they annexed. However, the 1852 map of Iowa City does still show this as a farm outside of the city. As we pass along here, uh, be sure you don't miss the noise of the traffic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, be sure you don't miss the different uses of materials for the buildings and the different details on the uh, buildings themselves. You can tell a lot about what was stylish at a time by what they put on a building and how large the building was. If you look back, not at the greenhouse, but at the one back there past the blue spruce, you'll notice up in the gable ends are some things that some people call gingerbread, but that's wrong because you eat gingerbread and you don't eat that. It's actually called millwork, and you could go down to the lumber yard and buy it by the uh, yard or the multiple yards and slap it around on your house wherever you wanted to. It was a very stylish thing to do at a particular time. Notice also right under that is a kind of siding that is different. You have the regular clabberding down below, but up in the gable end itself you have what either is scalloped fish scale or sawtooth, I can't see which, uh, siding. There was a period of time, particularly in the 1890s, when they liked to vary the surface texture of houses and put as many different kinds of things on as possible. The highlight of that is called the Queen Anne style when, believe me, more was better. And as many different things as you could have on was possible. One other feature you can see very well here about the houses is that in this time period from the middle 1800s through the turn of the century all of these houses were built with substantial front porches and most of the houses if you were planning to enter a house you would if you especially if you were a company you would enter through the, the front door the idea, idea with cars now and, and garages and so forth, uh, many houses out in the suburbs, the front door rarely, if ever, is used. And uh, here, these address the street by having a porch so that people coming up to the door, if it was raining or snowing, they wouldn't be standing outside in the weather. And of course, they didn't have air conditionings. They didn't have electric fans until well after the turn of the century. And so this would be the coolest part of the house and people would spend part of their days and part of their evenings out on the front porch. As time went along, uh, of course, people spent more and more time indoors and there was central heating and air conditioning and so forth. And what unfortunately happens is front porches fall into disrepair and frequently are just ripped off. And so many old houses around Iowa City, to an architectural historian, look very battered because they've had their front porches ripped off. These fortunately have good front porches. That one has been uh, somewhat altered uh, and frequently what will happen is they'll become enclosed, right? People will buy windows and screens and things to, to enclose them. And architectural historians kind of grit their teeth at that, but better an enclosed porch than one that's been ripped off, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, to add to that, as the porches were ripped off, social activity moved to the back of the house and became on patios, not on the front and porches. Porches are wonderful means of communication in a very small society like Iowa City would have been at the time. 
you're sitting on your front porch, somebody goes by, you wave at them, you're acknowledging them as somebody you like and would meet as a social equal. Somebody goes by and you ignore them, the reverse is true. Everybody knew how to treat everybody else. Just like in a rural area now, you meet somebody on the road in a car and you don't go like that, you have one finger on the steering wheel that you raise. A means of communication. And of course, transportation was different there too. The people along this uh, street would have been walking, riding horseback, yep. or in a buggy. And that makes that kind of Even more profound right, right. then. You'll notice most of the houses along here are wood. Most of them would not be built of native wood, a trees grown in the area, but rather by 1840, they were floating rafts of pine from Wisconsin and Minnesota down the Mississippi River to the lumber mills, Dubuque, Clinton, Davenport, and Muscatine, sawing it and then shipping it in. Now, they couldn't have shipped it in very well here until the 1850s when the railroad got here, but that's where the lumber's coming from. In the back there, we have a lovely Victorian house with all the brackets and chimneys and lovely front porch. When that house was built, that was considered the, the proper setback from the main street. And this then was its front yard. And it was landscaped, as we'll see when we go a little further. It has a, a row of red cedars, which are a native uh, conifer. It also has some very exotic conifers, uh, European larches across the front here, and um, uh, arborvita, a large arborvita, that tree there in, in the middle. When you think of arborvitas as little bushes, well, that's what an arborvita looks like after 100, 100 years. <laughs> uh, as time went by, though, I think you mentioned about not wanting to mow the grass at Plum Grove. Why, a lot of people don't like to take care of that much grass. And the front yard, was sold off and developed and here we have a modern house with a modern setback occupying so there's the original victorian house and it's still intact so it's nice to see see that but it's minus now it's front yard so that was the front yard front, front entry that's the front entrance that is the front door. right yeah right yeah. the house across the street is very interesting because <clears throat> it's of a style that basically, well, a lot of Victorian styles are eclectic. They throw a lot of features together, but that particularly has a Gothic revival. The pitch of the, of the roof and some of the detailing is, is a Gothic revival. And there's a, a very strange little portico or, or porch on the east side. So as we walk around, you can see there's a, a funny little porch where presumably carriages could uh, let people depart since... Uh, there probably was a driveway that looped around the house originally. Gothic Revival architectural style emphasizes the verticality of things, and you'll notice that there's much more verticality in that house than horizontal planes. Actually, Gothic Revival was most popular in the 1840s and 50s. The house was built later than that, but uh, they kept reviving styles, and many styles are called revival that really should be called the revival of a revival. <laughs> this keeps going on and on. Right. And of course, the front porch there has been enclosed, but not modified to the point of where it's inappropriate. So. This is one of the lovely landscape features that would have been <clears throat> added to the original house to make it more attractive and exotic in terms of its landscaping. This is a larch a European larch, and it is one of the uh, conifers that loses its needles in the winter. So technically it's not evergreen, right, because it loses all of its needles. If you come by here in the winter time, look and see, this tree will look like it's dead. It won't have its needles on like pine and spruce have. But you can see it's a very handsome tree, and the tree behind it echoes the same kind of weeping draping. That's a Norway spruce, the next tree behind. And the larch and the spruce were popular trees in cemeteries in Victorian time because they had the, uh, the aesthetic of sadness. They're dark, brooding, weeping trees, very appropriate for Victorian cemeteries. As were any kind of evergreen as a symbol of everlasting life in the next world. 
That's another, that's another tour, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and this is an interesting feature, too. This, this uh, step and the walking stones are the original. If you look at the stones that, that Old Capital are made from, this is the same Old Capital limestone. So this is a locally quarried and shaped stone. There is, uh, interestingly enough, if it still exists in the back, there was a large carriage stone right out in front here. Because when people got out of their carriage, they wanted the carriages to be high enough so they didn't get the mud thrown on people. <laughs> so to get out of a carriage was a long step down, and so they frequently had stones that they stepped out onto. And this, yes, and this house, at least when they redid the street here, they didn't take the carriage stone to the dump. The last time I saw it, it was in the backyard. Hopefully it's still there. So. Notice the uh, porch that Jeff mentioned off the east side of this house with the pendants. And the shingles are also <laughs> that scallop fish scale style there. Which would have been appropriate for the Very house. appropriate. Yeah. I expect, uh, if not original, a replication mm -hmm. right. of it. And possibly even if uh, they uh, had the money, those would have been done in slate. Yes, very commonly, very commonly. It, expensive then and very expensive still. But, but the hail doesn't hurt them right. quite as bad. Hopefully not. This uh, row of trees you see down the fence row here are red cedar. <coughs> They're a native tree. That's a tree where the Cedar River and Cedar Rapids and Cedar Falls uh, are named after the fact that that kind of tree frequently grows on rocky exposures along rivers. And so when this area was settled, trees like that grew along the Cedar River and Cedar Rapids and Cedar Falls and are the basis for them. Most of us have experience with cedar. Well, the older generations remember cedar chests, right? Fragrant boxes that you store your uh, wool goods in in the summer so the moths don't get them and put a few mothballs in there and the natural cedar fragrance discourages moths too. And the more recent generation, I'm afraid, is familiar only with cedars in the chips that are in hamster cages and guinea pig cages. And, so, and again, the fragrance there is kind of the, the original uh, oh, uh, cat litter <laughs> you know, sort of uh, basis. So. Uh, this house, which is a very, very impressive by anyone's standards, what architectural historians would refer to as an Italianate style. And so let's walk around. Uh, for privacy's sake, they've had let the vegetation grow up and give them a little privacy. So if you really want to get a good look at the house now, we've got to come around a little further. Bear in mind also that this street was not this wide nor this straight until the 20th century. It would have been a dirt track and it would have been not straight, but meandering. And you'll see some of the same themes repeated here. There's a larch tree and uh, various pine trees, this idea of having a large uh, monumental evergreens as part of the setting. I think you'll have to come to get a good view. You'll have to come all the way over here to this side. The Italianate style was common in the England and the United States in the 1850s and continued on until, oh, at least 1890. It uh, was characterized by brackets, wide overhanging eaves, a lot of different uh, roof lines, not, not a simple roof line pattern. Always had porches, sometimes called loggias, and usually the lintels in the later uh, Italianates were very ornate. This one's simple, so it marks it as an early Italianate. You should realize, however, that for the most part, Italianate architecture are designs of architects, and they're what the English and American architects thought the Italians were building or ought to build, not necessarily what the Italians were building. But it is called Italianate. And you can see the uh, use of the shutters, which would have been uh, important functional aspects in that time. The fun uh, shutters now are decorative elements, and they're often nailed right to the side of the house. They don't, they don't function at all other than to look nice. These would have been functional. 
and when there would have been uh, the sun shining on the particular side of the house, on the, when it was si shining on the east side of the house in the morning or the west side of the house in the afternoon, people could go around and actually lean out the windows and close the shutters to give them uh, shade, and yet air could still move through the, through the louvers. Sometimes the, sh <clears throat> the shutters were just on the outside, sometimes there were inside shutters as well. Both of those could be employed during stormy periods as, as, as well. So, yeah, you wanted to protect your window glass because it was expensive and the shutters helped in case of hail or strong winds to do that. Remember the glass in the windows at Plum Grove, see here the panes are much larger. We've now reached a point where the railroad has come to Iowa City. It's much easier and cheaper to get larger panes of glass now. This is a house that's very near and dear to me personally because it was built by the same gentleman that built the house I live in and, and many houses that people are familiar with in Iowa City, and that's Mr. Moffat. Uh, you might know on Muscatine there's a group of five little stone cottages that you assume that the uh, seven dwarfs minus two are living there in tiny little lovely stone English cottages that are now a historic district in Iowa City. Those and many, many other houses, not all of them quite as charming, uh, were the handiwork of uh, Mr. Moffat, and when he bought this property, it had a very small, simple frame house. And because he loved English architecture, he proceeded to take that little wooden frame house and use it as a core for building a brick English-style house around it. And so uh, the house is made from salvaged brick. You can see it has a, a very unusual, irregular look. When we think of brickwork, we think of, of a very tidy, pristine, and usually unpainted surface. Because these are used bricks, they don't match, so they weren't of a uniform color, and they were intentionally laid in this kind of wonky arrangement, irregular, to give the look of really antique bricks. To unify the, the building then in terms of color and also to probably protect some of the inferior older bricks that he were using, they were painted. And this is done, in, is done eventually in Victorian houses too because sometimes they were built of bricks that were locally fired and, and not very um, uh, water resistant. So it's not all that unusual to find older homes painted. This is not an old home. This would have been uh, uh, built, I would say, in the uh, 1930s when, when my house was built. You'll notice that behind this uh, perfect little Christmas tree, if you angle to one side or another, is a round window. If you go to the uh, gable of the garage, there's a, th a second round window. And if you look at the house that stands behind this, there is a third round window. I know that Moffat salvaged four round windows because I have the fourth one in the house where I live. So he let really nothing go to waste, and he was very fond of round windows. Uh, he owned the property behind as well and remodeled that. So this essentially, this quarter of the, of the city block here was the Moffat compound where he and his wife and then uh, some relative lived in the uh, adjoining house. The, uh, he made use of existing trees. The large oak tree that shelters the house is probably at least 100 years older than the house itself. So it was a large, handsome tree when Moffat expanded his house and is probably one of the features that he liked best. This is certainly one of the largest, if not the largest, black oak tree in, in Iowa City. And you'll uh, recognize some of the other old favorites, the uh, larches, the weeping larches, and uh, a combination, their present owner has added uh, a combination of some of the lower uh, evergreens to finish the landscaping. So this is a, uh, like I say, about 1930s towards the end of 1930s this would have been built, but it fits in lovely with the neighborhood. It keeps the large scale and uh, uh, a respective setback, right? He didn't crowd it to the, to the front, he kept it set back a distance.
brought you now, if you noticed uh, as we came through the gate, above the gate is the name Ardinia. And Ardinia, when I first moved to Iowa City uh, 35 years ago, was this whole quarter block area, landscaped much as you see it now. And beyond the circle here, there was a Scottish castle, a brick Scottish castle, or at least it looked an, a, an approximation of what somebody thought a Scottish castle looked like. This whole city block and the original frame house that was built here was a uh, result of a, of a Victorian convention in which proper, uh, wealthy people of that time would give rather extravagant wedding gifts. And this was probably one of the most extravagant wedding gifts ever given in Iowa City from two of Iowa City's most prominent and historic people. I've always thought that Kirkwood Avenue should have been called the Avenue of the Two Governors. Two Governors, because at one end we have Plum Grove, which we just came from with Governor Lucas, and the other end of the neighborhood ends with Governor Kirkwood's house. So we actually had two governors' homes facing out on, onto this set of street. And as you might imagine, two wealthy, prominent, important families, it wouldn't be terribly surprising that their children should marry. And this area that became Ardinia was a wedding gift. It's midway between the two family homes, just a proper distance, right, from the in-laws on either side, the, the Lucases on that side and the Kirkwoods on the, on the other side. And it was a lovely, uh, a large home. Eventually, over the years, the home uh, was sold to a man by the name of Berkeley, who was quite a um, uh, prominent business person and owned lots and lots of property. Some of you might remember the old Berkeley Hotel south from the Pentacrest. It occupied a whole, the whole corner there. That, of course, was one of his main properties, a hotel here. Some of you might know uh, St. Agatha's. Uh, what other names does it go by? Park House. Park House. Uh, this is that uh, prominent On apartment. Duke Street across the church. Right. He also owned that building, and if you notice on the west side of that, even though it's been remodeled several times, there are funny little brick porches, two-story brick porches, and if you look up in the corner of those porches are tiles that have a capital scroll letter B. Those porches were added by Mr. Berkey, who, by the way, added the same kind of two-story brick porches onto the front and side of the Berkey Hotel, if you remember those. So he had a great fondness. He also had a great fondness for Scottish architecture. I don't know whether he had some ancestral delusions or what. But. So he turned this property into a Scottish castle. And he did that by building this elaborate fence. This is added in his period. And taking the original wedding house and wrapping it around on two sides by a brick version of a Scottish castle. It was two and a half stories tall with brick and had stone trim and the crenulations and the and the whole the thing. At the top Battlements, in case right? The neighbors attack. So pour boiling water. You would have come in, you would have come down you would have come down Summit Street, which is the premier one of the premier neighborhoods. Come down Summit Street, terminate in this gate, open the gate as we did, come in. There was a circle here with a fountain pool in the center and then the castle loomed all the way across the back. And of course, the castle, or I remember when they tore the castle down and, and put in these condominiums. And as much as I dislike that, at least I think they've respected a, an important space. We still have a sense. We could still come in today through the original gate, talk about the original fountain, and with a little bit of imagination, you can still see a Scottish castle lurking across the back. He also, Mr. Berkeley, was also very fond of model trains. And on this property, he had a model train very much like the one that's down in City Park. In fact, for all I know, it might even be the one that's in City Park. But it used to, a, a large uh, scale model train that would carry people used to uh, loop around through this estate. And children used to come and take rides and that sort of thing. We do have to remember that there is not really such a thing as Scottish castle architecture. It was all in his mind. It's what he thought the Scottish castles ought to have looked like. But it is nice to see that this yeah. development, has, in a sense, has, 
has respected a sense of that. I would imagine there are all kinds of developers that would have got their slide rules out and figured they could squeeze one more unit on here. <laughs> right. Get another right. whole room. Right. And right over the gate that you came in is the uh, carved stone uh, panel that says Ardenia on it. That was and retained. that's the name he chose for yes. his house. I, right. Again, I don't know what exactly he was I referring to. I don't know to, either. But... is one of uh, Iowa City's uh, most historic residences. It may not be one of the most beautiful or glamorous, but it certainly sheltered one of Iowa City's most important historic figures. And this is the other governor who lived on this street. And in fact, the street was named after him. And many streets through Iowa was named after him because he was a very prominent figure, which I'll let Warren talk about that in a minute. Some of you have wondered about the, the landscaping here. And this is... Um, is landscape. Some of you may think, my God, this is a jungle. I need to bring a shears. But this is a style of landscaping that is late Victorian that's called very romantic. This is to look like, you might say a jungle, but a forest, right? A little glade in the forest. And the people that lived here obviously respected their privacy. They weren't happy about living on a busy, busy street with people like us gawking at them probably every day. And so they, for whatever reason, adopted this very romantic woodland in your front yard landscape and so that's essentially what we what we have uh, later why we'll go around originally of course that this property was a substantial one and we'll go around and see an outbuilding in the side yard and so forth and this of course was built as infill at a much later time but Lauren why don't you tell them about Kirkwood because he certainly is a very interesting person. Samuel Jordan Kirkwood was governor of Iowa from 1859 to 1863. He is known as the Civil War governor and he was for the first two years of the Civil War. William Stone was actually governor the last two years of it. But he was a very strong unionist and anti-secession and so he is probably personally responsible for the raising of a majority of the 47 infantry regiments that Iowa did supply for the Civil War. He uh, built this house after the Civil War, but he was governor again after the Civil War as well. So he had three terms as governor, but they weren't consecutive. He was also a U.S. Senator for two terms, and he served in a president's cabinet as Secretary of War. He is the only Iowan to be governor, senator, U.S. senator, and in a presidential cabinet, the only one to do that. He started life as a miller in Coralville, and this house, the date on it is there, 1867. It's right around there, anyway. Uh, and I want you to look at this house. It's a frame house. It has brackets. Uh, it has the simple wooden lintels and sills because we're going to go out of the jungle and look at the house across the street. I want you to see the contrast. Uh, both elegant houses, both nice setbacks, an entirely different uh, style of presentation of yourself to the public, which would be going by on this avenue there. Yeah, I'm sure that the people of his day realized he was a very great and prestigious man, and he didn't feel the need to convince them by the nature of his house. Right. It would have even in its day been a modest oh, house. It, it would not have been a, a mansion by any right. means. That house across the street is much later in time. And somebody that's definitely trying to that's uh, somebody secure who their social prominence. That's somebody who wants to know that they have the money to build that house. But let's go around the corner and see the yes, little side we'll building on, first, on right. the Kirkwood house here. Originally, of course, the house would have had all of the, the land that you see around here as part of its, its yard. And this would have been an outbuilding. And Lauren and I, every time we give this tour, we have the same discussion, right? We've not, neither one of us have done enough research, I think, to be definitive. But we, we, we stage a, uh, an agreement to disagree about whether that little brick structure is an original privy or a smokehouse. It's about the right size for either one of those functions. Uh, Lauren, I think you, you, I think it's a privy. Lauren thinks not. I think not because it doesn't have the ventilating holes in the gables. Right, but uh, smokehouse needs those as well. It has a, it <laughs> the has chimney. A chimney. Right, right. But 
not ventilating holes. It well, a chimney. a chimney. And there's no chimney, though. Either. But I'll bet there was because that's not the original roof. <laughs> So we really need to do more research on this. It, it is either it is either a privy or a smoke house. <laughs> well, it's still there. We can't very well do that. You will see the end of the Kirkwood house, though, from here, a much better view. Uh, and you can see the size of it, bearing in mind that the part off to the left is an addition. You can see where the original house ends, where the brackets end. So it was not a small house, not a really modest house, but uh, not a too much above average house at the time either. And this would have been lumber brought from uh, the pine forests of Minnesota and Wisconsin and then railroaded into town, probably planed and manufactured in uh, Davenport actually. <laughs> This is a house where the uh, landscaping is in uh, transition. If you look around, you can spot the uh, century-old trees, the same cast of characters we've gotten used to on the beautiful old houses around here, the Norway spruce and the larch and so forth. Then there is a new addition of uh, a new set of uh, evergreens here that are uh, gradually obscuring the view of the house. And so we have uh, kind of a a situation where this may end up like like the Kirkwood house where it's not going to be seen from the street and certainly the builders would have frowned upon that they because would have they, they went wanted to, they to wanted it. you to see this house go ahead and tell them about uh, this house is commonly known as the Gotch house but should actually be known as the crumb crum house he built it and his uh, house that he lived in before this was on Iowa Avenue uh, by the one way, it's the one with the stepped gables on the north side of Iowa Avenue down towards the end. At any rate, he was a publisher of a local newspaper, and he built this after he had made enough money to do it, and he wanted to demonstrate that he had. No offense to him. Lots of people did that at the time. It was fashionable. But I do think he got... I think it's still fashionable, by the way. It may be. <laughs> what he did, uh, I do fault him on getting suckered in on a blue light special for brackets, however, because you do not need that many brackets to hold up that eave. Uh, the wide overhanging eave and all of the brackets is reminiscent of the Italian style, but this is, uh, well, towards the end of the Italianate style, actually, uh, of its popularity. But it's of brick. It would have been a commercially manufactured brick. He would not have fired this himself. You'll notice uh, over the, that the front door is a rounded arch. That's very typical of the uh, Italian eight. And also above the front door on the second story, uh, above the ground, you will see that there's a three-part window. That's often called architecturally a Palladian window because during the Renaissance, an uh, a Florentine architect named Palladio developed that as a stylish sort of thing. The middle one is supposed to be the tallest and the two flanking ones are uh, shorter than that. And if they're even, then they didn't do it right. And it has nothing to do with religion. It's not a symbol of the Trinity. It's a symbol of the Italian Renaissance, which was far from religious and far from Christian. Uh, just the number of brackets just uh, Fascinates there, me. Uh, many of the features would, even of the period, I would think people have, would have thought ostentatious oh, I overkill. Think they would, they would yeah. have said, wow, <laughs> because, look what Mr. Because, Crumb you can see, afford. Because cur curved top windows were expensive to make still them, are. and still are. Mm -hmm. And so you have clusters of those curved top windows, yeah. and then to just rub your face in it, they sit within a curved frame. <laughs> and that's how you see. You'll notice, which is stone, which is carved stone. You'll notice carved that stone. the lintels yeah. over the doors and the windows all curved. Come down, they're curved, and then they come down a little bit. They're called drip uh, lintels because it looks like they're kind of melting and dripping down the edges there. And then there's fancy stonework on the mm -hmm. corners, as they would have called coins. Coins. So mm -hmm. that everything about the house just shrieks of. See, he could have simply money. used bricks and a different bond for that. No, he used blocks of limestone. Fancy, fancy stone. Very, very well-dressed limestone. Very smooth, beveled limestone. Because I can afford to buy smooth, beveled limestone. <laughs>